Please turn with me in your Bible then to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, as we continue our verse-by-verse study through the first epistle of Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. This is indeed one of the greatest verses in Scripture, and I feel very inadequate for this. If I was a great preacher like Martin Lloyd-Jones, I think I would preach ten sermons on this very, very verse. 1 Peter 3.18, God's holy word. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, truth divine, dawn upon this soul of mine, word of God in inward light, wake my spirit, clear my sight. Dear Holy Father, may that be the prayer of each one of us today as we look at your holy word, your word of truth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the context here in chapter 3, 13 through 4, 11, Peter is encouraging the persecuted saints in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, which is modern-day Turkey, about an area of 300,000 square miles. And he's encouraging them to persevere through it all. Why? Why do so? One is because persecution is part of Christ's call to suffering. You look at the Old Testament saints, you look at New Testament saints, you look at all through the Bible, and isn't it the pattern that Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, you are a saint of God that when you are persecuted, it's part of Christ's call to suffering. 2 Timothy 3.12, all the godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 1 Timothy 3.3, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we were appointed to this. Acts 14, 22. We must through many tribulations enter into the kingdom of God. And Jesus said in John 15, 20, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. We think of Jesus' example. Hebrews 5, 8. He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And 1 Peter 2, 21. For as much then as Christ suffered, you should follow his example. Secondly, suffering is the pathway to blessing. I encourage you to read chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. We won't cover that now. We'll be covering that up ahead. But suffering is the pathway to blessing. Here again, the example of Christ. Chapter 1, verse 10. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. The sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So, number three, suffering is indeed the pathway to glory. Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We think of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress and Christian's journey from the city of destruction to the celestial city. It's from down in the depths of the city of destruction to upward on the heights of the celestial city. And as Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, the Christian life is like a mountain of ice. You pickaxe your way up one step at a time. And that's just the opposite today, friends, of the easy believism and cheap grace that is out there today of Dietrich Bonhoeffer was talking about in the cost of Christian discipleship. It's salvation that costs us nothing. It's worth nothing. The health, wealth, and prosperity gospel that's out there today is straight from the pit. You accept Christ, and you get all this health, wealth, and prosperity, and you slide right into glory on this pathway of ease. Just the opposite of the biblical, it says, suffering is the pathway to glory, and the Christian life is a mountain of ice. You pickaxe your way up one step at a time. You get into the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, you'll slide into something, and I can assure you it won't be glory. Number four, suffering is the pathway to wean the saints from the world. John Newton, the great hymn writer, said this, Savior, if on Zion's city I through grace a member am, let the world deride or pity, I will glory in thy name. Fading is the worldling's pleasure, all is boasted pomp and and show, solid joys and lasting pleasure. None but Zion's children know. I think of Hebrews chapter 11, that great 
hall of faith that's there. You think of Abraham in 11, chapter 11 there, verse 10, he says, He waited for a city, he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Foundations are found in glory. Not here below, friends. Job 26, 7. It says the world hangs on nothing. In Psalm 17, 14, it says the men of the world have their portion in this life, in this life, whereas believers hope in God and our inheritance is in glory. Hebrews 11, 6. But these, the patriarchs, they desired a better country, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. I look at Abraham, and you look at chapter 11, verses 8 and 10, and the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they were tent dwellers here. They were tent dwellers here. And they also then, after they pitched their tent, they made altars here, places of worship to God. And that order is very important. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't stay at home in this world anymore. Hebrews 13, 14. Here hath we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Friends, if you and I are the hagias of God, the holy ones of God, we indeed separate ourselves from this world. And it's only truly then that you and I can worship God in spirit and in truth, as it says in John 4, 24. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You may prove it is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Saints hope include mansions in glory. They have their foundations built upon the rock, Jesus Christ. John 14, 1 through 6. So Peter wrote to these suffering saints in the first century, and he's writing to us. And he tells us that suffering has God-given purposes, and perseverance is the mark of those that are truly saved. Matthew 10, 22, He that will endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And if you don't evidence perseverance, then you're never saved in the first place. You're merely an apostate. 1 John 2, 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For they've been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that it might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So, in the context here, Peter says to saints, and he's saying to us, Be confident, fear God, do good, refrain from fear. Unbelievers will hate you. They'll persecute you, just as they did Christ. It comes with the territory. He said that in 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12 also. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak evil against you against evildoers, they may, by your good conduct which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Romans 8, 7, the carnal mind is at enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Peter goes on, he says, do not revile when reviled. Suffering is a sign. Is, suffering is not a sign of God's displeasure. Because Christ saved, traveled that same pathway already. But those who suffer as Christ suffered will be glorified as Christ was glorified. And someday you and I look forward to the day when we will see him as he is, because we'll be like him. 1 John 3, 2. Friends, Christ is Lord. The gospel of Christ is the only message of salvation. So be bold and be prepared with an apologia, as it says in 1 Timothy 3.15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give a defense, apologia, of the faith that you have with meekness and with fear. We need to defend the gospel. We need to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ as though God were speaking through us. 2 Corinthians 5.20. Now, we get to our current context, chapter 3, 18 through 22. And Peter solidifies what he's been saying. Believers will suffer, and it's the pathway to blessing and to glory, by saying Christ is our example of suffering. Evil in the present is temporary. Victory is sure, because Christ triumphed over the evil powers. And so will all of us who are in Christ. The theme, and mark this, friends, the theme of verse 18 is not the imitation of Christ, 
but it's the victory of Christ over evil. It's not the imitation of Christ, but it's the victory of Christ over evil. Christ suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that's in you than he that it's in the world. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning and his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. O oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the saving flood. My prayer for us this morning is that Christ, who accomplished his purposes through suffering, would be an encouragement to each one of us as we face opposition and persecution. That through the Spirit's enabling, we be able to follow Christ's example. That we'd evidence a worthy walk. That we would set our hope in Christ. And the doctrinal truths of this verse today would illumine our minds. And they would help us. They would be a girder to us to stand against the flesh, the world, and the devil. Do we glory in Christ's victory? Do we glory in Christ's victory? The first point this morning is the Redeemer. The Redeemer in verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins. J. Gresham Machen, the great theologian who died January 1st, 1937, fought against liberalism. And liberalism was all caught up in denying the fundamentals of the faith. Now, I'm not talking about fundamentalism. I'm not into isms. And I'm not talking about fundamentalistic. It is very sad today, the day and age in which we live, that the fundamentals have been so degraded. Key doctrinal truths that you and I, the hills that we die on, have been so degraded. And now to be a fundamentalist means that you are someone who is into rules and regulations. Instead of one who exemplifies their Christian walk that stands for certain core beliefs. J. Gresham Machen believed in five fundamentals of the Christian faith. The inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the historicity of Christ's miracles, and the atoning work of Christ on the cross. The atoning work of Christ on the cross, one of the fundamentals of the Christian faith, is 1 Peter 3.18. We sing the praise of him who died, of him who died upon the cross. John Bunyan had Christians say, Bless cross, bless sepulcher. Blessed rather be the man that there was put to shame for me. Friends, Christianity is Christ. But you can't have Christ without the cross. They are inseparably linked together. What did Jesus say was to be the essence of the apostolic message after he ascended into heaven? Luke 24, 46 and 47. Jesus said to them, Thus it was written, thus it was necessary that Christ should suffer and be raised the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. That's the essence of the apostolic message. Peter said that in 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot and without blemish, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last days for you. Paul said the same in 1 Corinthians 1, 23. He says, but we preach Christ crucified in 1 Corinthians 2, 2. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In Galatians 3.1, he says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you before your face, Jesus Christ was clearly betrayed among you as crucified. Crucified. Who crucified Jesus, friends? The Jews did. The Gentiles did. The whole human race did. And God did. Acts 2, 23, Acts 4, 27 and 28. I think of a song that was popular a few years back about uh, the Roman soldier who held the hammer in his hand. And the songwriter said when he looked, he realized the hammer was in 
his hand. You and I, born in sin, held the hammer in our hand that nailed Jesus to the cross. But ultimately, who killed Jesus on the cross? Was God, God the Father. Acts 53.10, it was God the Father's pleasure to bruise him. John 3.16, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. 1 John 4.10, here in his love, not that he loved us, not that we loved him, but that he loved us and gave his son to be a propitiation for our sins or an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It's interesting in looking at this verse that the best Greek text here says instead of, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the best Greek texts say, Christ died once for our sins. Calvary, friends, was the motive behind Bethlehem. The incarnation was not an end in itself. It was a means to an act. It's the means to an act, and that act is the act of redemption. And remember, redemption is not the same as your salvation. Redemption is the means to your salvation, the means to the end. Redemption is deliverance by the payment of a price. It's an act of God in which he himself pays as a ransom the price for sin which has outraged his holiness. Originally, the term meant the freedom of prisoners of war. You'd free prisoners of war by paying a ransom for them. And then the term was enlarged to, for the freedom of slaves, out of slavery. They were put on the slave block, and then you would pay a ransom, a latruon, a latruon then to free them from the bonds of slavery. Christ's death on the cross was a sacrifice by nature. It was substitutionary in character. And both Christ's, sacrifice, or Christ's work on the cross as a sacrifice and being substitutionary are both denigrated today. Most professing Christianity is Arminianism today. Charles Finneyism. And Charles Finney believed in the governmental theory of the atonement, which believed when Christ was on the cross... It was merely as an example for you and I to attest that God hated sin. In no way, shape, or form was it sac sacrificial. In no way, shape, or form was it substitutionary. And you and I say that Christ's death on the cross was the antitype of the Old Testament sacrificial system. When you go to Leviticus 16, you remember once a year the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. And there in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant was that slab of gold that was called the Ark of Covenant or the Mercy Seat. And above the Mercy Seat, God, once a year, the Shekinah glory would come down between the cherubim there with their outstretched rings. And the, holy, the high priest would go in there and he'd shed blood first for his own sins and then for the sins of the nation. He'd spread them over the Mercy Seat. And he'd spread them in front of the mercy seat. And by spreading it over the mercy seat, that shed blood then was the covering there that made atonement for the sins of the people, that blocked, as it were, God's vision between the Shekinah glory there on top of the mercy seat and between the law of God that was in the Ark of the Covenant that condemned everyone who had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You and I now recognize that Jesus Christ as a new covenant is the antitype of that sacrificial system. He is not only the sacrifice. He is not only the high priest that does the sacrifice. He is also the hilasterion. He is also the mercy seat. The atonement covering for you and I. And if there is no Christ, there is no Christianity. And if there is no Christianity and Christ, there's no cross. And the cross, there was the shedding of blood. And the shedding of blood is a metonym, a part that stands for a whole. There was a death, a death that had to occur for the victory over sin. And you and I need to realize the heinousness of sin. Most people today, professing Christendom, the majority, as I said before, they do not accept that Christ's death was a sacrifice. They do not accept that it was substitutionary. Substitution, they don't understand. Substitution is an effective arrangement which actually secures immunity from obligation for the person for whom the sacrifice acts or the substitute acts. Payment God cannot twice demand. First in my bleeding surety's hand and then again at mine. Hallelujah! Once for all. Hapax. Perpetual validity. Never to be repeated again. 
Do I hear an amen? Amen. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews. We'll flesh this out. Leave your finger there in 1 Peter. We'll flesh this out a little bit. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Now go down to ver chapter, or verse 12. But this man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 14. For by one offering he is perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Now look at chapter 9, verse 12 and verse 14. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Almighty cross, love lifted high, the Lord of life raised there to die. His sacrifice on Calvary has made the mighty cross a tree of life to me. Friends, do we glory in the cross? Do we see the necessity of the atoning work of Christ on the cross? That he came to save us indeed with a sacrifice once for all? That we have eternal security in him if we put our faith in him? Now you understand Jesus when he said in Luke 9, 51, I must go to Jerusalem. In Matthew 16, 21, then Jesus disclosed to his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes, and be killed and be raised the third day. Jesus says, John 12, 27, escape this hour? Oh, no. For this hour I have come. Jesus came to die, to die for the sins of his people. And he did that once for all. Martin Luther, the great reformer, was putting up with and confronting the theology of glory that was in his day. And the theology of glory in his day said that you seek to climb, the philosopher said, you seek to climb to the highest hill of knowledge of God by great thoughts on great things. Martin Luther said in the face of the theology of glory, that would never save anybody. He says what saves is the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. And Martin Luther said instead of the theology of glory, it's a theology of the cross that looks to the humanity of Christ, the lowliness of his condition, that he would voluntarily go to a cross to shed his blood and sees in his humiliation and shed blood there the work of the atonement which actually saves people from their sins. Just think what's going to occur on our lips when we go to glory someday. Revelation 5.12 Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Because why? Revelation 5, 9, and 12. Because thou wast slain and redeemed us. You were slain and you redeemed us. Do we glory in the biblical terms and the theology that's there? The word about God and Christ? Do we glory in that? Or do we shun it? Do we glory in Christ's victory? The first point is the Redeemer. The second point is the righteous. The righteous. Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. Your version might say the righteous for the unrighteous. Literally, it means the just for the unjust. Righteous. What does it mean to be righteous or just? It's the quality of conformity to the law of God. Not only in obedience to its precepts, but also execution of its just penalties when it's violated. It's not only obedience to its precepts, but an execution of its just penalties when it's violated. You see, friends, the law is the revelation 
of Christ, the revelation of God, his character, his character. And the true gospel in which the righteousness of God is revealed always has law as its referent. Romans 1, 16 and 17. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. To everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You see, you can't have the gospel without first the law of God. And one of the functions of the law of God, it's a mirror to point out to us the dirt that's there, the sin that's in us that condemns us. And then you see, we need the gospel. We need the gospel. Why is hell endless? Why is hell endless? It's not like Catholics say, you know, it's got a back door and you're just there for a little bit and whoosh, you're out of there. No, it's endless. Why? You'll only realize the endlessness of hell if you know the heinousness of sin and the gravity of one sin. As R.C. Sproul said, sin is cosmic treason. John Piper defines sin as any attitude, action, or desire that explicitly breaks a commandment of God is not done unto the glory of God. Or the Westminster Shorter Catechism, Q&A number 14, says what is sin? Sin is transgression of or lack of conformity to the law of God. No wonder, Paul says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Romans 3.10-12, through 12, there is none righteous, no, not one. They've all together become worthless. They've all turned aside. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who seeks after God who understands. Why is hell endless? Because infinite guilt infinite guilt that's incurred by one sin could never be assuaged or done away with by finite suffering. That's why hell is endless. And as Anselm said in response to that, infinite guilt can over be, only be overcome by an infinite person whose sufferings are worthy enough and vast enough to more than overcome the most infinite guilt. So you've got the infinite for the finite, the one for the many, the innocent for the guilty, and in doing so, the death of Christ became the death of death. See, John Gerstner said, in light of the total depravity that's in man, that we're all headed for hell, if it wasn't for God's initiative and his mercy and grace to us. He says, where people get it wrong is the tea of the tulip, the total depravity. People don't understand the depth of their sin. I told the congregation last Sunday night, the only thing I don't like about the, the hymn that we sang about the once for all is it says there we were bruised by the fall. No, we weren't bruised by the fall. We were nigh unto destroyed by the fall, wrecked by the fall. As Spurgeon said, it wasn't that Adam fell and busted his little finger. No, when Adam fell, he broke his neck and ruined the human race. That's the depth of the fall. And still we understand that depth of the fall and the condition of original sin that results from that. We will never understand the heinousness of sin and we will never understand the need for Christ then as the just to stand in our stead and be our sacrifice and our substitute for us. See, Christ saved us not only by his active obedience on the cross, by voluntarily going to the cross, but he also saved us, as theologians say, by his, excuse me, his passive obedience in going to the cross, his voluntary obedience, but he also saves us by his active obedience, his obedience of the law, perfectly. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Think not that I came to destroy the law of the prophets, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill one jot or one tittle shall no way pass from the law to all be fulfilled. Perfect obedience by Christ. So then you see on the cross, there's the double imputation that takes place. Our guilt, our sin on him, and in turn then his righteousness then is credited to our account. Do we glory in Christ's victory? The first point is the Redeemer. The second point is the righteous 
The third point is the reason. The reason. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. The reason, then, that he might bring us to God. This is a technical term, friends. That he might bring us to God means that we might gain entrance into his court. That we might gain entrance into his court. Remember, God is of pure eyes to behold evil, Habakkuk 1.13. Remember the seraphs in Isaiah 6. They had six wings. What did they do with two of them? They covered their face. Because, you see, God dwells in light that's unapproachable. That is the essence, the magnificence of his glory. And the purity and the sinlessness of it is, you see, we can't approach that in our finite. that he might bring us into his court. Remember Esther, in the book of Esther, when she was thinking of going to the court of the king of Ahasuerus? She wasn't invited. And she, re she fasted and prayed and had Mordecai and all the Jews prayed for him because she realized that for her to get in there, you see, she'd have to have an acceptance by the king. And that acceptance was the king then would extend the scepter to her. If the scepter was extended toward her, she kissed the scepter as she bowed in front of him, then she was accepted and she could air what she had to say. If not, all he had to do was hold back the scepter. And she would, even though she was queen, immediately be hauled out and killed. So to you and I, you see, to go into God's court, we can't get in there because of our sin. We would be killed instantly. And what happened with Jesus when he died on the cross? Remember Matthew 27, 51, what happened with the veil of the temple? The veil of the temple that weighed several tons was rent in two from top to bottom. So what happened is now because of Christ's death on the cross, he being our mediator, you and I therefore have boldness and we can enter into the holy of holies, the holiest place, because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Hebrews 4, 16, therefore, let us have boldness to enter there, that we may obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We don't, Go into the holiest of holies now presumptively. But when we pray and we worship, spiritually we can go there. And someday in our glorified bodies, we will be before the throne of God. We will see Jesus as he is. And with a beatific vision and with spiritual eyes, we will see God. You see, you and I don't need a Roman Catholic priest to be our mediator to go before God. Through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, the way has been opened up for us right into the Holy of Holies. We can go to the very throne room of God in Jesus' name, clothed with Jesus' righteousness, so that we can obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. Do we glory in Jesus' victory, the Redeemer? First point, second point, the righteous. The third point, the reason. And the fourth point is the resurrection. The fourth point is the resurrection. I've been reading a biography of J.C. Ryle. And J.C. Ryle said, and he, he lived from 1816 to 1900, said that the resurrection is a doctrine that is sadly neglected. Sadly neglected. And I asked myself, I said, is the doctrine of resurrection neglected in our days? Now, I took these books off my shelf. They're great theology books. Here's R.C. Sproul's Essential Truths of the Christian Faith. So I looked on the inside here. Inside says of Jesus Christ, the deity of Christ, subordination of Christ, humanity of Christ, sinlessness of Christ, virgin birth, Christ is the only begotten, baptism of Christ, glory of Christ, ascension of Christ, Jesus Christ as mediator, the threefold office of Christ, the titles of Jesus. I read that to my wife and I asked her, I said, Nance, anything missing here? And she looked at me and she says, where's the resurrection? Right on. Now, does R.C. believe in the resurrection? Why, of course he does. But why isn't it listed under Jesus Christ? I picked up B.B. Warfield's book, Biblical Doctrines. Great, great book on biblical doctrines. And I look here, and it says here, 
predestination, foresight of Jesus, spirit of God in the Old Testament, biblical doctrine, the Trinity, the person of Christ, God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ that Paul preached, Jesus' mission according to his testimony, the New Testament terminology of redemption, redeemer and redemption, Christ our sacrifice, on the biblical notion of, review, of renewal, the biblical doctrine of faith, terminology of love in the New Testament, prophecies of St. Paul in the millennium and the apocalypse. Does B.B. Orfield believe in the resurrection? Well, of course he does. But where is it? See. Well, now I'm getting frustrated. So I pick up James Montgomery Boyce's book, The Foundations of the Christian Faith. And so I look here. And he has the attributes of God, and he's got the law and grace, the fall of grace. And then I get down to the person of Christ. He's got listed here. The deity of Jesus Christ, the humanity of Jesus Christ, why Christ became man. Prophet, priest, and king, quenching God's wrath, paid in full, the greatness of God's love. Ah. The pivotal doctrine, the resurrection. Verifying the resurrection. Amen, hallelujah. You know what? Good Friday is nothing without Easter. Good Friday is nothing without Easter Sunday. A Savior that dies on a cross is not an actual Savior. You see, the cross and the crucifixion, you cannot separate it from the resurrection. They are inseparably linked together. Paul said that when he defined the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also see, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The two pillars of the gospel, the crucifixion and the resurrection. You can't have one without the other. The crucifixion, Christ's victory over sin. The resurrection, Christ's victory over death. Inseparably linked together. And the resurrection is a central core truth of the gospel. It's Christ's triumph over death. All the key doctrines of the Bible are realized in the resurrection. It's God's stamp of approval on the work of Christ. So it verifies God, it verifies the deity of Jesus Christ. Romans 1, 3, and 4, concerning his son David, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Concerning his son, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. And declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, what? By the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. See, the resurrection also verifies, not only identifies Jesus, but it verifies that what he said was truth. You know, the essence of prophecy is Isaiah 41, 23. Show us things that are hereafter that we may know that you are God's. Hmm, what did Jesus say? He got on the road to Caesarea Philippi and Matthew 16, 21, he says, I must needs go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer many things there at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and the scribes. I'm going to be killed and I'm going to rise again the third day. Now, if he doesn't rise that third day and go through all of that, what's going to happen? You see, he's a sham. He's a liar. So it verifies. And think of the apostles. The apostles. They proclaimed, you look at the Gospels. The Gospels. The synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. What are they? They're really, they're not biographies of Jesus. They're more so their passion narratives. And you take the Gospels, anywhere from one-third to one-seventh of each of the Gospels is nothing but passion narrative. All that happened in the last week of Jesus' life, all the suffering he underwent, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And you see it also entailed in all of this is the truthfulness of Jesus' word to us. Because he rose from the dead, every word he said to us is true. And also, he has the power to save. You see, because he raised himself up, he's going to raise us, us up also. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23. He's the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Everyone in their own order. Christ's fruit, first, he's the first, and then us. It's the guarantee that you and I will be resurrected also. 
Jesus Christ has the power to save. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, all power, all authority on heaven and earth is mine. The resurrection. May we glory in that as a central doctrine of Christianity. Do we glory in Jesus' victory? We looked at four points this morning. We've looked at the Redeemer. We've looked at the righteous. We've looked at the reason. We've looked at the resurrection. You know, in facing the enemy of World War II, Winston Churchill never promised his people an external health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. Rather, he put before them the duty, the challenge, the responsibility that they had. And he lifted up their sights to a noble cause. Here's what he said in one of his speeches. I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, sweat, and tears. What's our aim? I answer one word. Victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. For without victory there is no survival. We shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight in the seas, the oceans. We'll fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island whatever the cost may be. We'll fight on the beaches, we'll fight on the landing grounds, we'll fight in the fields and the streets, we'll fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. Are you and I called to fight? You see, the victory is ours in Christ. The victory is ours. I shared this example a few weeks ago in illustration. Everybody knows it, Grace, and said I muffed it, so I'm going to give it again. Billy Graham was asked if he was a pessimist or an optimist. He says he's an optimist because he's read the last page of the Bible. He's read the last page of the Bible. We win. We are victors in Jesus. Now that is the sovereign end. But that does not mean that you and I are lax. You see, the words that Peter spoke to the persecuted saints are the same words that apply to us. You and I have to fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil. We're to strain. We're to fight. We're to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. Ephesians 6, 11. Strive to enter into the straight gate, like it says in Luke 13, 24. Agonizomai. Agonize with all your might. You see, why? Because God is not only sovereign over the ends, he's also sovereign to the means to the ends. And he's sovereign over that moral agency of ours. You and I are to exercise our moral agency as instruments of God's hands to his decreed foreordained end. So you see, you and I are to increase in holiness against the persecution, the opposite is there. We are to increase in pleasing God, increase in obeying God, increase in our readiness to repent of the sin that is there, increasing in our awareness of how heinous that it is. And we are to increase in our praise of God through Jesus Christ for the victory that is ours in Christ. And may that praise be in our lips continually 24-7, 365. And in closing, I want to share with you the greatest hymn that was ever written. Charles Wesley wrote over 8,000 hymns in his lifetime. And he said he'd give them all. He'd give them all. Just to say he had written this one hymn. And that one hymn was Isaac Watts' great hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And what I want to end with is this. I want us to take the truths we've learned this morning from 1 Peter 3.18 and I want us to apply that, those truths, to our Christian walk and our solemn pledge to worship God continually and praise Him continually in light of this hymn. My acknowledgement, first verse 1, my acknowledgement. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Verse 2, my attitude. My attitude. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God, all the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. Third verse, my awe. My awe. A.W. Tozer defined reverence as the astonished awe that results when a person truly sees God as he is. My awe. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet or thorns compose so rich a crown? 
And the fourth verse is my aim. My aim. Were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your holy word, your word of truth. I thank you for the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. And I thank you that the spirit and the word work concurrently. And I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that as I study your word and as we study your word, that your Holy Spirit will illumine our minds and that the truths that are in, the great doctrinal truths that are in verse 18 of 1 Peter 3, Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit. May those truths resonate in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives each and every day. May we walk in its light. May we glory in those truths, dear Heavenly Father, that have been accomplished for us by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, authored by God the Father and applied to us by the Holy Spirit. And I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that our aim would be to look at your love as being so amazing that it demands our soul, 